أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد ولا آله وصحبه وسلم رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأبتة من لساني يفقه قولي السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته my dear brothers and sisters and friends let me begin by thanking Sheffield Hallam University's Islamic Society for inviting me today uh, to discuss uh, briefly the life of a very important figure in Islamic history and that is Khalif or Sultan Abdul Hamid II Rahimahullah. I'll be using the title Khalif and Sultan interchangeably uh, and I won't go into the semantics of the difference between the two terms but essentially they mean the same thing. When you look at Ottoman history and you look at Islamic societies and masajid, the Muslim organizations, when they talk about Ottoman history, they nearly always only speak about two leaders. Yeah? Considering it's the dynasty that uh, ruled large swathes of the Muslim world for like over 600 years, held the seat of the caliphate for 400 years. But we nearly always speak about two rulers. Uh, Sultan Fateh, who conquered Istan uh, Constantinople in 1453, and Khalif Abdul Hamid, and that's two out of potentially, I think, 40 rulers. Yeah? And that's because the life of Khalif Abdul Hamid has a massive significance in the world we live in today. In many parts of the world where our parents originate from, whether that be from the Maghreb in North Africa or the Arab world or even the Indian subcontinent, many of the political realities in those existing regions right now has something or another to do with the many challenges that Khalif Abdul Hamid rahimahullah, faced during his reign. Of all the Ottoman rulers, Khalif Abdul Hamid is the only one that has an entire period named after him by both Muslim and non-Muslim European historians. It's called the Hamidian period. You don't get that with any other ruler in, in the Ottoman dynasty. Yet he has an entire historical period named after him in literature, the Hamidian period. There is no justice that I can even remotely give in terms of real depth about his reign in the space of 30 to 40 minutes. Or even if this was a whole day course, I would not be able to give any serious justice to the depth of his life, his reign, his struggles, and the many things which he experienced during his 33 year rule. So what I decided to do today is to go over a chronological overview of the main events in his life. So you all should have a handout of a timeline and go over some of these events, briefly discuss why they're significant to his reign and inshallah conclude with the lessons that we can extrapolate from his reign and his life as to what it means for us as Muslims in 2019. Khalif Abdul Hamid or Sultan Abdul Hamid, he was the 34th Sultan and the 25th Khalifa of the Ottoman dynasty. That's because the first eight Ottoman rulers were not caliphs. From Sultan Selim Yovaz onward, the ninth Sultan onwards, they were Khulafa and they were Sultans. And he ruled for 33 years, one of the longest ruling Ottoman rulers in history, right? And so therefore many, many things happened in his life, right? And Essentially, he was the last, not Ottoman ruler, he was perhaps the last Islamic Muslim ruler to have real independent legislative and executive authority over the domains he controlled. After Khalif Abdul Hamid, whether it be within the Ottoman domains or beyond, no Muslim ruler had the authority, the independent authority, which Khalif Abdul Hamid yielded during his reign. Again, another important factor, which we will look into later on in the talk. Now, Khalif Abdul Hamid came into power in 1876. And one of the very first things he oversaw was the implementation of the first Ottoman constitution. Now, the first Ottoman constitution was a set of liberal and modern reforms that were born out of the Tanzimat period. The Tanzimat period began around 1839. In short, this was a set of re reforms and a movement 
that sought to emulate uh, certain aspects, actually not even certain aspects, major aspects of uh, surrounding European powers uh, in, in, a, in an effort to modernize the Ottoman state so it could survive at a time where it was declining economically, politically, militarily. But the issue with the Tanzimat reforms was that many of the reforms was based on secular liberal epistemology and philosophy. That it, it essentially was focused around emulating and mirroring the neighboring European powers and how they sought to modernize and, and, and survive in the era that they were respectively in, and that that would somehow grant the Ottoman state longevity and for it to be a contemporary and competing power with the surrounding European powers. So that Tanzimat movement uh, was, is what essentially led to the first Ottoman constitution of 1876. There's also a misunderstanding, I would say, that those who pushed for the Tanzimat reforms were all Western European agents. That's not true, right? To begin with, those who wanted these modernization reforms had the interests of the Ottoman state at heart, right? Irrelevant of where they sought those answers and solutions from, their intentions was that they wanted the Ottoman Empire and the Ottoman state to survive and to be strong. And they couldn't find answers anywhere else except for in Europe, right? And sadly, many of those reforms went against fundamental basics and principles of Islam, right? So anyway, 1876, the first Ottoman constitution, which then meant that there was now a parliament, the Ottoman state was a constitutional monarchy, right? I don't like using that term because these terms have, uh, have their meanings and the definition in European Christi Christian language and political paradigms. But nevertheless, that's what it was, right? The Ottoman state in 1876 had a constitution, it had a parliament, and it had the head of state who was Khalif Abdul Hamid, and for laws to get passed through, it had to go through parliament and then kind of signed off by the Khalif Abdul Hamid, right? Khalif Abdul Hamid also inherited a state which had major debt. He inherited a state which was under constant threat in all frontiers. He inherited a state which had kind of lost its identity and had lost its way. And it was constant, its, its sovereignty was constantly encroached upon by neighboring European powers, namely Russia and to a lesser degree Britain and France, who were constantly seeking opportunities when that opportunity arose to either wage war against the Ottoman state or to agitate, fund, or arm uh, separatist rebellions within the Ottoman state, namely in the Balkan areas, right? This was the context in which Khalif Abdul Hamid came to power. This is what he inherited. In 1877, Russia declared war on the Ottomans. It was an unprovoked war, and it was basically to just take advantage at a weakening state. From around early 1830s, there were no expansionist military campaigns from the Ottomans. The Ottomans essentially always fought defensively, right? There were no, uh, you know, wars or battles or campaigns to extend the frontiers and the domains of the Ottoman state. It was nearly always defensive. <laughs> And so when the Russians declared war against the Ottomans in 1877, they were swiftly defeated, the Ottomans, sadly. Um, and in 1878, we saw the Treaty of San Stefano. Now, the Treaty of St San Stefano, uh, it was a very harsh treaty, which resulted in the loss of uh, Romania, Serbia, and Montenegro, those countries, uh, or those lands that were formerly uh, Ottoman provinces, they, were be they became independent. Parts of Armenia was given to Russia, and there were major reparations, war reparations. And these reparations came with interest. It was a very harsh set of treaties, right? So, looking at that, the Treaty of San Stefano, other European powers intervened to ease some of these uh, clauses of Stefano. So Britain, France, Germany and Italy, they intervened 
I don't want anyone to think that they intervened to genuinely and sincerely help the Ottomans. They did it to prevent Russian, rapid Russian advancements in the Balkans and the Far East. So it was in their benefit to prevent and change some of these clauses in Stefano, uh, the Treaty of Stefano, uh, so they could counter Russia. So they had the, they had the Congress of Berlin in 1878. And in that Congress, uh, the other European powers basically told Russia, look, take it easy on the Ottomans. Uh, they're a weak and crumbling state. Uh, and they collectively put pressure on Russia, um, whilst obviously looking at their own colonial interests at the same time. Uh, but what happened in the Congress of Berlin was the likes of Britain and France also sought to capitalise on the weakness of the Ottomans. So Cyprus was subsequently kind of sold off to the, to, to the Brits for easing off uh, the conditions of the Treaty of Stefano. We saw in 1881 France occupy Tunisia. We see in 1882 Britain enter Egypt and Sudan under the premise that the Ottomans could not uh, maintain law and order, and they stayed there. We saw in 1890 to 1893 the Armenian uprisings. So I want to just comment something on the Armenian uprisings. For those of you who know a bit about Ottoman history, uh, or even if you follow current affairs, you know that the Armenian genocide, or what's understood to be the Armenian genocide, is something that's regularly, uh, it's, it's, a, it's an accusation that's uh, levied against uh, the Ottomans historically and even the modern Turkish state. Um, there were two incidents uh, which fall under what is known or regarded as the Armenian Genocide. It was the uprisings of 1890 to 1893, which was quelled by Khalif Abdul Hamid. And then there was uh, the exile uh, during World War I under the leadership of the three Pashas. Yeah? Uh, after Khalif Abdul Hamid, no Khalifa, no Sultan really had any influence or proper control of the Ottoman state. It was essentially run by a group called the Young Turks, and then later these three individuals called the Three Pashas. But the point I want to make here about the, or what's understood uh, as the Armenian Genocide, brothers and sisters, is that this is a, it's a claim, it's an accusation that's levied against the Ottomans by Europeans who at the time were, were <laughs> carrying out industrial scale massacres all around the world where indigenous people were being wiped out in their millions in Australia, in Congo, in South America, in North America. Yet the same European powers politicized and weaponized the uprisings, the Armenian uprisings, to basically make Khalif Abdul Hamid look like a regressive tyrant. It also needs to be noted that the Armenians were citizens of the Ottoman state. They were tax-paying citizens of the Ottoman state and had been for centuries. They were offered the security and the stability. Their property was looked after. Right? Their religion was preserved by the Ottomans. They were citizens of that state. So when evidence surfaced of collusion and collaboration with the enemies of the state, then it now needs to be understood from the perspective of treason. Right? And Europe at the time used the Armenian issue, like they did with other issues, to present to the rest of the, the, the continent that Khalif Abdul Hamid was a backward, regressive, bloodthirsty tyrant. When all Khalif Abdul Hamid was doing was dealing with an internal issue of potentially treason. And he quelled the uprisings uh, because he saw it as there were Armenian revolutionaries that were collaborating with Russia, a country that they were at war with. In 1897, we saw the loss of Crete after the Ottomans defeated Greece. The Ottomans defeated Greece, uh, but they lost Crete. They lost Crete because the European powers collectively decided that it wouldn't be fair demographically to have an Ottoman ruler over Crete. It made more sense to have a Greek prince. So they defeated the Greeks, but had to give Crete up. We also saw... Bulgaria joining Eastern Romania, an independent autonomous province. And with all these things happening, with the loss of large swathes of land, right, and essentially bullying from all the European powers, that pushed Khalif Abdul Hamid of the Ottoman state to gravitate towards Germany as a European ally. And so we saw in 18, 
1999, the commissioning of the Berlin Baghdad Railway. This was a railway which would, was basically going to go from Istanbul to Syria to Baghdad. It was commissioned, it was funded, and it was built by German engineers. We also saw, after the, uh, you know, the gravitation towards Germany, German senior military personnel and financial ad advisors taking a more great and hands-on role in Ottoman state affairs to modernize them, to reform the army. Um, because according to Khalif Abdul Hamid, these issues weren't to do with religion, philosophy, epistemology, morals or values, right? And he's correct in this. To modernize an army has very little to do with uh, your understanding of man, life and universe. Right? You're modernizing an army, and if there's another empire or another country that has a better army and they're willing to share that experience and to help modernize that, then that's not a problem. And the same with economic fiscal policies, that they had German advisors come on board and basically tell them how to better manage their financial affairs. What Khalif Abdul Hamid did have a problem with was taking social values and morals from the Europeans, which he felt were in contradiction to Islam. And his predecessors from the early 19th century onwards, for whatever reasons, most of which were sincere, was simply seeking answers to a state which was essentially in decline, right? But perhaps one of the biggest achievements of Khalif Abdul Hamid's life was the establishment and the building of the Hijaz Railway. The Hijaz Railway, which was, it started building in 1900 and it reached Medina in 1908, it was a huge symbol of what Khalif Abdul Hamid rahimahullah, represented as a ruler. Now many European historians would say that, oh, it was just like any other railway line. It was just a means of transportation to move resources, military resources and, and, and things from one part of the empire to another part of the empire. But this is untrue. Khalif Abdul Hamid rahimahullah, what he wanted to do with the Hijaz Railway, he understood that the Balkans was fracturing. He understood that parts of North Africa were being occupied by the Europeans, but the lands which still remained strongly under Ottoman control were the heartlands of historic Islam, Asham, Mecca, Medina. And he wanted to strengthen the ties between these regions, as well as increasing revenue and commerce in these respective areas, as well as making life easier for the pilgrims when they were traveling to make Hajj. Because many, many of the Hujjaj were dying because of the perilous journey from wherever they were coming from, from part of the, the state. And as I will mention later, the Hijaz Railway was a great symbol of the pan-Islamic mindset of Khalif Abdul Hamid. That when he realized that he wasn't getting the assistance and the answer, but he didn't even want the answers from Europe. But when he realized that he was literally surrounded by powers who were literally just waiting, counting days and months to finish the Ottoman state off, he sought to re-strengthen uh, the Ottoman uh, relationship with those regions that fell under its domain and beyond, and beyond. In 1905, there was an assassination attempt uh, by Armenian revolutionaries. Alhamdulillah, Khalif Abdul Hamid delayed his public appearance by two or three minutes, and a car bomb went off, which martyred 26 people, but he wasn't killed. And in 1908, right at the end of his rule, there was a young Turk revolution, which uh, re, uh, it reintroduced the, the Constitution of 1876, and I actually just realized I forgot what happened. In 1876, when he oversaw the Constitution, two years later, after losing the war to Russia, Khalif Abdul Hamid got rid of that Constitution. So in 1878, he disbanded the Ottoman Parliament and the Ottoman Constitution because he felt that it was counterproductive to the kind of vision that he had in mind for the Ottoman state and the Muslim world in general. So the Ottoman constitution of 1876 lasted for two years, and then the Young Turk Revolution in 1908 uh, succeeded and bought back the constitution. 
and historically is known as the second constitutional era. So with that in mind, Khalifa Abdul Hamid found himself towards the end of his reign exactly like it was at the beginning of his reign, where he was a constitutional monarchy with a parliament who held him to account. That's not to say that he wasn't being held to account, brothers and sisters. He was, but through a different mechanism. But now you had this parliament, this Ottoman parliament, which would essentially dictate uh, the laws of the state and decreasing significantly the legislative authority of Khalif Abdul Hamid. In 1909, there was a counter-revolution, an attempted counter-coup, which was unsuccessful. Now, European historians and Kamalists and secularist historians will say that this counter-coup was actually carried out by illiberal uh, conservative elements of the Ottoman military who didn't want to modernize or reform the Ottoman state and they wanted to reinstate Khalifa Abdul Hamid as the overall dictator of the Ottoman state. I have a massive problem with this kind of language and this kind of terminology, brothers and sisters. I'll tell you why that is. It's because it perceives not just Ottoman history, but Islamic history from a framework, from a paradigm which is alien to our tradition. Right? And it applies and superimposes certain experiences and language and frameworks which is absolutely applicable and correct for European and Christian uh, history to the Islamic history, right? Yes, there was a counter coup which was unsuccessful and it was carried out by elements that were loyal to Khalif Abdul Hamid but loyal to Khalif Abdul Hamid because they believed that the reinstating of the constitution was taking the Ottoman state towards the wrong direction. But they were unsuccessful. And as a result of their failure, uh, Khalif Abdul Hamid in 1909, he was dethroned, exiled, and replaced by his brother, Murad V Rashad, who from that point onward just became a ceremonial figure for the Ottoman state. And Khalif Abdul Hamid was indeed not just the last great Sultan, he was one of the last great Khalifa of Islam. Because from that point onward, there was no rulers, there was no Islamic or Muslim rulers who had any real authority or independence. Or their ruling and their governance and their authority was not independent to that of external powers. Now some of you may be wondering, if Khalifa Abdul Hamid is supposed to be such a great historical figure, why was the entire timeline filled with losses and losses and losses? That's because, brothers and sisters, we have to appreciate, and I mentioned this earlier in the talk, the context in which he came to power. What did Khalif Abdul Hamid inherit? He inherited a state which was in huge debt. He inherited a state which was under constant threat from surrounding European powers. And I'm not just talking about a perceived threat, I'm talking about literally every other day, there was some kind of encroachment on Ottoman sovereignty by European powers. Whether it be in North Africa, in the Balkans or Southeastern Europe, there was a constant daily threat of some kind of liberties that were being taken as a result of the weakness of the state. Now for those of you who want a more kind of elaborated uh, overview of the Ottoman history, I did give a talk at Sheffield University. Uh, you can just Google it, Ottoman history, Sheffield University, ISOC. It should come up. Um, and he inherited huge debt and huge reparations. And these were reparations that were signed by his predecessors. Right? After the Crimean War, there was a war called the Crimean War where Britain and France helped the Ottomans fight Russia again for their own geopolitical interests. After winning that war with the help of Britain and France, there were massive interest-based reparations which Khalif Abdul Hamid inherited and he had to manage that. So there was an external threat from European powers, there was the issue of debt and there was the internal issue of secular reformists who wanted to overthrow his authority who wanted to undermine the Islamic vision that he had, are were constantly seeking answers from Europe. That is what he inherited. And considering that that's what he inherited, wallah, he achieved a lot. There is a near consensus 
amongst all historians, Muslim, non-Muslim, secular, Muslimic, whatever you want to call it, yeah? There is a near consensus that had it not been for the rule of Khalifa Abdul Hamid, the Ottoman state wouldn't have survived beyond 1900s. That because of the radical policies that he implemented during his reign, that the, the Ottoman state managed to survive for another 50 years. There is a near consensus amongst historians regarding this. And what were his achievements? His achievements was that, and I'm going to list a few of them, they number many, and they require their own respective elaborations. But I'm just going to go over some of them. Some of the economic policies that he implemented were radical from the perspective that his predecessors had disproportionately focused state funds on things like building palaces and building unnecessary masajid when the entire state and empire was full of masajid. Khalifa Abdul Hamid stopped that. Yes, he built some masajids, right? But he stopped this kind of excessive beautification en masse of mosques across the, the empire. What he instead did was that he would put up Islamic symbols, the names of Allah, the names of Muhammad, the four khulafa, and stamps and seals. He put the green flag with the three crescents, which represented the Ottoman Khilafah. He put these kind of small symbols up everywhere, instead of building grandiose mosques and palaces, which is something his predecessors did a lot. He also implemented major educational reforms. Under Khalif Abdul Hamid, we saw universities and madrasas, law schools and medicine schools, med, uh, medical schools, propping up all over the state. Why? Because he understood the importance of both the dini education in the form of madrasas and what is known as the kind of secular education. And he realized that for revival and for the preservation of Muslim identity, and for the future of the Ottoman generations, that the tarbiyah, the morals, the principles, and the values of Islam had to be instilled in both these educational uh, academic institutions. We also saw, of course, um, the Hijaz Railway, which I mentioned. Now, the Hijaz ra Railway uh, line was massive. It was massive because... Khalif Abdul Hamid sought the financial assistance from Muslims beyond the Ottoman state. The Muslims of India donated the equivalent of today hundreds and thousands of pounds towards the building of the Hijaz Railway. Khalif Abdul Hamid is also on record to have supported some of the early Darul Uloom seminaries of India. The Shia ruler of Persia he even gave some money towards the Hijaz Railway. So the point I want to make is that he got as much support outside of the Ottoman state as he did inside. And it is known that Khalif Abdul Hamid had a strong diplomatic relationship with the Muslims of the Philippines, of Mauritania, of China, who all supported the Hijaz Railway and gave their money towards this cause, fi sabilillah. Never in Ottoman history do you hear of an Ottoman ruler seeking assistance and a call for unity beyond the, the, the realms of his domain. This was something that was very unique to Khalif Abdul Hamid. He also allowed the proliferation of a number of Sufi tariqas uh, in the Ottoman state. Now one may be wondering, well, well, what's that got to do with anything? The reason why that is, is because prior to Khalifa Abdul Hamid, a number of Sufi tariqas, right, they would get charged money uh, by the state for their lodges, for their tekkes, uh, and for their kind of building that they used to have for their dhikr sessions, right? Khalifa Abdul Hamid, not only did he not charge them any money, he allowed them to grow across society where they had a very influential role. Again, that's linked back to the educational reforms, right? Tacitly linked to it because where Khalifa Abdul Hamid was seen that they, uh, uh, the, the Muslim youth of the Ottoman state were getting the academic, um, the academic um, education from secular uh, subjects or from the madrasas, the Sufi tariqas to him uh, symbolized the spiritual Enrichment, the spiritual 
um, uh, aspect that was needed for the preservation of Muslim identity. And all of these things, brothers and sisters, put together, represented Khalif Abdul Hamid's resistance and persistence. His persistence in seeking an alternative answer for revival away from Europe, and his resistance to major pressures, externally and internally, to seek answers from other than Islam. All these things, all these things represented that. And if we are to be honest to ourselves, and answer this basic question, why is the life of Khalifa Abdul Hamid important to us? Why are we here in 2019 in Sheffield at 10 to 7 discussing this man's life? It's because his struggles and the struggles he experienced and the socio-political reality and environment which he found himself in is very similar to the challenges that we are facing today. In the Muslim majority world, there are so many countries that are either occupied or they are marred and, and, and with wars and invasions. In the West, are we not facing an intellectual struggle against redefining normative aspects of our deen? Isn't there a coordinated effort where millions of pounds are being put into to redefine aspects of our religion where there has been a near consensus for 1400 years on, on many of these issues. All of a sudden, in the 21st century, these things are now up for discussion and for debate. Are we not being told constantly that aspects of Islam need to reform, aspects of Islam need to modernize, aspects of Islam need to get with it, that it's regressive, it's backward, it's medieval, it has no, it has no relevance in the, modern, in the modern time. These were the same calls and the same pressures which Khalifa Abdul Hamid rahimahullah, faced in his time. Is not one of our issues, collectively as an ummah, the issue of asabiyah and nationalism, that we have 57 plus Muslim countries, Muslim majority secular nation states, that none are willing to assist another when, when, they, when there's issues happening in their, in their neighboring countries. Whether that be the issue of Kashmir, and Pakistan, or East Turkestan and Pakistan, Bangladesh and uh, the issue in Myanmar, the Arab states and Palestine and Syria, what's happening in Central African Republic and Somalia and other places, just seems to be general apathy. Not from the Ummah, certainly from the leadership. And one of the causes of this is nationalism. I have to look after my country's affairs first. And it's not even that, that's the truth. The political elite that currently rule over the Muslim world today, they don't even care about their own people. Let's be frank about it. They're there to oversee the preservation of certain geopolitical interests that usually either belong to Russia, China, or the United States. But nationalism is that disease. Instead of blaming everyone else, if you look at it introspectively, we've allowed nationalism to seek the minds and hearts of ourselves. And of course, there's the external threat. We can't even deny the external threat. For those of you who are following current affairs, what's happening to the Muslims in India recently, right, with the, with the uh, Citizens' Amendments Act, where we've been in East Turkestan, we have nearly 2 million Muslims in concentration camps, or in Kashmir, Myanmar, Palestine, Syria, Iraq, Central African Republic. There's, there's, there's not a place where there's not problems that we're facing. To conclude, and I guess if there's one thing we can take from the life of Khalifa Abdul Hamid, is that he was a man who came at a time where he identified an issue and he identified the solution. He understood that the Muslim majority world, not just the Ottoman world, just not the Ottoman state, even beyond, was fractured and disunited because it didn't have something or someone to rally around and unite upon. Not something that had real substance and longevity. And he understood and he identified that the only thing that people can unite upon 
is Islam. This is something that's within our text, within the Quran and Sunnah, constantly there. Right? The brotherhood of Islam and the justice in which it offers its citizens. Right? This is not to say, brothers and sisters, I want to clarify this also. Islamic civilization was not a utopia. Even when the Prophet ﷺ ruled Medina and the Khulafat al-Rashidin, it was not a utopia. We never claim utopia for our civilization or our history. There were many problems. But the point here is that Khalifa Abdul Hamid understood that to unify the people and the citizens of his state and beyond, he would have to re-exert the importance, the Islamic importance of his role as the Khalifa and the institution of the Khilafa as something for the Ummah to get behind both internally and externally. At a time when that concept was eroding away. That's not to say that his predecessors again did not understand the notion of a caliph or Islamic unity. They did. They did. That's why I said that Sultan and Khalifa was interchangeable. It essentially meant the same thing. But Khalifa Abdul Hamid understood that this notion had to get re-exerted the Ummah had to get re-educated about its importance for everyone to get behind him and get behind the revival of the last standing Islamic empire of that time. But it was the Qadr of Allah that obviously it wasn't meant to be. And of course, due to his reign and due to the policies that he implemented, the Ottoman state did survive for another 30, 40 years. Right? But... It is very common to hear uh, derogatory propaganda against Khalifa Abdul Hamid. Very common. Right? There are pubs in the UK that, you know, it's called the Turk's Head or the Saracen's Head or the, the, the you know, you actually have pubs, by the way, called the Turk's Head. I've never been to one. I've, I heard that they exist. Right? And the logo in these pubs called the Turk's Head, Wallahi, it's exactly the same face of Khalifa Abdul Hamid with vampire fangs and things like this. The bastardization of Khalifa Abdul Hamid was something that was widespread, right? And quite frankly, whether people want to accuse him of tyranny, of being a dictator, of being an oppressor, or being someone who was illiberal and wanted to resist modernization and reform and all that, I'm going to quite frankly say to them that perhaps that may be true according to your epistemology, according to what you deem to be was the right thing for the revival of the Ottoman state. But quite frankly, the reason why Khalifa Abdul Hamid is championed from East Turkestan, from India, from Asham, to put many parts of Europe today is because he represented what revival should have been. But one would argue perhaps it was too little too late. It was the decree of Allah that the Ottoman state was going to lose World War I and it wasn't going to survive beyond 1924. Right? But the point is, if and when we hear these kind of propaganda against Khalifa Abdul Hamid and even against the Ottomans, who weren't perfect by the way. For those of you who have the time, if you listen to my talk that I gave in Sheffield not too long ago, I said it was not a utopian state. They had many issues, especially towards the latter period. But the point here is that they always centered their position in the world as an Islamic authority. One that wanted to look after the affairs of Muslims and the security of Islam and all the citizens uh, of, and the people of the book that fell within its domains. So quite frankly, we reject these propaganda lies by Orientalists and Western Europeans and Kamalists who accuse Khalifa Abdul Hamid of so many things, right? Uh, the truth be told, when they say that he was someone who resisted modernization, what they mean by this is that he resisted a particular kind of modernization. When they say that Khalifa Abdul Hamid was illiberal, it's because you, he wasn't liberal enough for you. Right? And I think, to conclude, one of the things that we need to do collectively is to own our narrative. Right? To overcome a, a, an understandable inferiority complex which has come into the minds of many Muslims as a result of the war on terror as a result of the endless wars and propaganda against Islam and Muslims. The institutional Islamophobia that we're all experiencing and have been for the last 19 years. 
to slowly but surely overcome that. Because Khalifa Abdul Hamid, he could have easily, easily just let the French and British come in. He could have easily just adopted everything from the Tanzimat and what the Young Turks wanted. But he didn't, he resisted it. He resisted. And he was, to, to a big degree, he was successful. So we need to start owning our own narratives, brothers and sisters. When we look at the future of the Muslim world, the political destiny, the self-determination, the concept of revival, these things have to be done on our own terms. According to our tradition. Not something that's been externally imposed upon us. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim.